April 30th, 1943. The body of Major William Martin of the Royal Marines floats off the coast of Hueva, southern Spain. His plane has crashed. Another life cut short. But this is bigger than one man. Martin carries secret documents outlining the next stages of the Allied war plan, the invasion of Greece and Sardinia. Allied intelligence agencies are panicking. They know that the Spanish authorities will pass these documents to the Germans. Months of planning are down the drain. Churchill and Eisenhower are furious. Or are they? Perhaps there's more to this than meets the eye. And now, a word from our sponsors. Hey kids, nine out of 10 doctors recommend joining the Time Ghost Army. This is Spies and Ties, a series of World War II in real time, and I'm Astrid Deinhardt. Hello, darlings. You've probably all realized that there's something not quite right about Major Martin and his paperwork. As you have seen in Indies and my episodes, the Western Allies are not preparing to invade Greece and Sardinia. They are going to Sicily. So, what's going on? Well, my dears, would you be surprised to learn that the body in the sea belongs to someone else entirely? This corpse is at the centre of Operation Mincemeat, an elaborate effort to convince Hitler that Operation Husky is no more than a diversion from Greece and Sardinia. It's a tale of deception, double cross and dead bodies that will continue to fascinate into the 21st century. It all begins long ago, back in September 39. I've mentioned John Godfrey, director of the Naval Intelligence Division, a couple of times, haven't I? Uh, here he is. Well, just after the war broke out, he drew up a memo on ideas for feeding false information to the enemy. He compared deception to fly fishing. The deceiver needs to be patient, vary his methods, and decide when to cast his line and when to hold back. It becomes known as the Trot Memo. Item number 28 is the one that we're interested in. The title of the item is a suggestion, not a very nice one, and is inspired by a detective novel named The Milliner's Hat by Basil Thompson. It describes dressing a corpse as an airman, filling his pockets with paperwork and dropping him on an enemy coast. Does that sound familiar? Oh, and there's something extra exciting about the Trout Memo. It might not have been written by Gottfried at all, but by his personal assistant and hold on to your shorts. Who is that? Yes. It's Ian Fleming, that Ian Fleming. We can't know for sure, but the pieces fit together pretty damn well. Godfrey and Fleming had a great relationship, working together in room 39 in the Admiralty Building in London. Fleming had free reign to dream up cunning plots. Later, he will use Godfrey as the inspiration for MI6 boss, M, in the James Bond books. And here's the kicker. The millinery's hat sold very few copies, but you know who owned and read all of Basil Thompson's books? Hmm? <coughs> who would that be? Well, of course, Ian Fleming. Anyway, it won't be until late uh, 1942 that Godfrey's or Fleming's ideas will see the light of day. It all begins with a near disaster for the Allies in September of 42. Britain and America are preparing for Operation Poch, the invasion of French 
North Africa. On September the 25th, a Catalina seaplane flying to Gibraltar from Plymouth is brought down off Cadiz during a storm. On board are two men carrying important documents. The first is a Royal Navy courier named James Haddon Turner. He carries a letter confirming that Supreme Commander General Eisenhower will set up his headquarters at Gibraltar. The second is Louis Danielou, a free French intelligence officer. He carries details on British targets in North Africa. Their bodies wash ashore and are picked up by the Spanish. Spain is neutral, but the authorities frequently cooperate with German intelligence, and southern Spain is crawling with German spies. If the Spanish hand over those documents, Operation Torch will be torpedoed. Turner's body is handed over to the British consul after 24 hours. An examination finds dried sand still caked into his pocket buttons. If someone had taken out the letters, the sand would have come out as well, right? So no one has read the letters. But Daniel Yu's notebook has been read. We know this because the information is picked up in decoded German Enigma messages. Fortunately, the Germans dismiss the find. That was a close shave. But this catastrophe inspires a man named Flight Lieutenant Charles Chumley. At six foot three and with thick glasses, he's too tall and too blind for flying. But he has found a home in the RAF's intelligence and security department. From there, he has been seconded to MI5 and finds himself secretary of something called the Double Cross Committee. Its real name is the 20 Committee. But 20 is two crosses, a double cross in Roman numerals. The committee brings together the top minds of MI5, MI6 and military intelligence. Their job is counter-espionage. The 20 Committee runs the highly successful double cross system which captures and turns German agents, turns them, right? It's so successful that committee chairman John Masterman of MI5 will claim post-war that he and his men controlled the entire German espionage system in the UK, which is not at all far from the truth. They're experts in deception. Once agents have been turned, they are used to feed false information to the Germans. Like Fleming, Chumley's job is to imagine far-fetched schemes. After the Catalina crash, he sees the opportunity to make the Trout Memo reality. So, on the last day of October 42, he outlines something he calls Plan Trojan Horse. A body is obtained from one of the London hospitals. It is then dressed in army, naval or air force uniform to suitable rank. The lungs are filled with water and the documents are disposed in an inside pocket. The body is then dropped by a coastal command aircraft at a suitable position where the set of currents will probably carry the body ashore. Chumley presents his plan to the 20 committee on November 5th. The committee sees merits but pokes more holes in it than a Swiss cheese. What if the plane carrying the body was intercepted? What if a post-mortem shows that the corpse was dead before entering the water? What if the enemy doesn't believe the body belongs to a real officer? The committee tells Chumley to go away and refine the plan. Do it again. Because the body would be delivered by sea, Masterman assigns Chumley the help of the Naval Intelligence Representative on the 20 Committee. That would be Lieutenant Commander Ewan Edwin Samuel Montague. Montague started off 
in room 39 with Gottfried and Fleming. Now, he runs his own subsection in room 13, known as 17M, M for Montague. It deals with intercepted German communication. He too had read the Trout Memo back in 39 and is a strong supporter of the plot. Their first job is to find, well, a body. That is easier said than done. Chumley and Montague assumed that they could just waltz into any old hospital. I mean, Britain is awash with bodies, of course. Men are being killed at the front and civilians are dying in air raids. Suicides are up as well. But they soon realized that the vast majority of London's cadavers aren't all that suitable. You can eliminate all of those who aren't a man of military age and fitness. Those who died of gunshots or burns at the front or in a bombing at home won't exactly pass as an air crash victim. Suicides are tricky too. Death from hanging, gas or chemicals can be picked up post-mortem. It's not just the mode of death. The body needs to belong to someone whose life and death went unnoticed, who doesn't have family or friends, who will ask awkward questions and who can't be traced easily. Fortunately, Montague has a couple of friends who are expert in the art of death. These are Sir Bernard Spilsbury and William Bentley Purchase. Sir Bernard is the home of a senior pathologist. Purchase is the coroner of St Pancras in London. He oversees suspicious death in his district. And on January 28th, Purchase contacts Montague. I have a suitable candidate. So, two days earlier, a 34-year-old man named Glinda Michael had been found unwell in an abandoned warehouse. Michael was homeless, mentally ill and almost illiterate. He died in hospital and his death was recorded as suicide by eating phosphorus-based rat poison. How about that? Inquirers find that there is almost no one who would notice his death. His home is far from London in Tony Pandy in Wales. His parents are dead. His siblings have moved on with their lives. But Glinda wasn't no one. I'll tell you more about his unfortunate life and death in my next episode. Will his body do? Purchase assures Montague that the dose of phosphorus wasn't great enough to show up in an enemy post-mortem. A large dose would have killed him outright, but Michael took at least two days to die from liver failure. Spilsbury agrees, you have nothing to fear from this Spanish post-mortem, he says. Time is of an essence. Michael's body cannot be frozen. That would damage the soft tissue, giving the game away under examination. Purchase reckons it can last three months in the mortuary refrigerator. So... On February 4th, Operation Mincemeat is approved by the 20th Committee and given its name. Now they must construct a man who never was. It begins with the obvious, a name and a uniform. Royal Navy officers travel in dress uniforms, but Chumley and Montague can't exactly take the corpse to a tailor, right? So instead they settle on a Royal Marine. Marines travel in their battle dress, which comes in standard sizes off the pick. Now for the ID card. The names of all Royal Marines officers are publicly available on the Navy list. So, they need to hijack a real name. They settle on Major William Martin. A Major is the sort of rank that would be entrusted with sensitive documents, right? Conveniently, the real Major Martin is in America on a training mission. The corpse is given ID card number 
148228. Place of birth is Cardiff, a nod to Glyneth Michael. An ID photograph proves difficult. They take a few shots, but it's obvious that the photos are of a corpse. After several weeks of searching, Chumley finds an MI5 colleague to serve as a double. They carefully fill out the rest of Major Martin's life. Letters are written from a fictional father mentioning fictional cousins and aunts, another from Lloyd Bank requesting payments of an overdraft. Martin's pockets are filled with bits and pieces indicating a stay in London, a book of stamps, keys, a packet of cigarettes and even a bus ticket. Montague and Chumley create a man well-educated but kind of careless and somewhat of a loner. A man who has escaped off his duty in the Royal Marines for adventure with the commandos and who is an expert in amphibious operation and landing craft. That will form the core of the deception. But they have missed something. Montague's assistant, Joan Sanders, points out that Martin has no love life. So a call goes out to all the young women working for naval intelligence. Bring us your photographs. <laughs> Montague already knows who he wants. Jean Leslie, a 20-year-old secretary who he has a bit of a crush on. She finds Montague charming and enjoys his company, so she happily supplies a photograph. She becomes Pam, Martin's fiancé. Her photograph, along with love letters and the receipt of a wedding ring, makes it onto the body. Things are almost ready by the final week of March 43. Montague and Chumley still need to find a way of explaining to the Germans who Martin is and why he will be on an aeroplane going to North Africa that just so happens to crash near Spain. They also need to concoct the deceptive information about upcoming Allied plans for this. Martin carries three letters with him. The first is a personal letter from General Sir Archibald Nye, which Martin has been tasked with forwarding from Algier to the Vice Chief of the Imperial General Staff, General Sir Harold Alexander, in Tunisia. The two generals will be discussing the next stage of the war. For weeks, Montague has been struggling with a forgery. Then he realizes why need it be a forgery. He asks General Nye to draw up something professional yet chummy. Nye's letter mentions two upcoming assaults. One on Greece and one on an unspecified location in the Western Mediterranean for which Sicily is a cover target. But why is Martin going to Algiers in the first place? He can't just be a glorified postman, can he? That is explained in the second letter. So, this is from Martin's boss, Lord Louis Mountbatten, to Admiral of the Fleet Sir Andrew Cunningham, who is Commander-in-Chief in the Mediterranean. It introduces Martin as an advisor posted to Algiers for the amphibious assault in that Western Mediterranean attack. The target isn't named, but it, it is hinted at pretty heavily. Mountbatten, well, Montague, jokes that Martin might bring some sardines with him. Even a German sense of humor would make the sardine Sardinia connection, right? The final letter is of no military significance and serves only to fill the remaining empty space in Martin's briefcase. It's a request from Mountbatten asking Eisenhower to write the foreword to a book on the history of the Royal Marine Commandos. Hmm. 
soon. Everything is ready. The mission is signed off by the chiefs of staff on April 13th. Churchill and Eisenhower give their approval two days later. On the evening of Saturday, April 17th, the body is prepared. It's placed in a specially designed canister in which dry ice will flush out the oxygen and prevent de decomposition. Martin is driven up to Greenock in Scotland, where the submarine HMS Seraph will carry him on his final journey. Seraph departs at 1600 on April 19th. At 4.15 in the morning of April the 30th, Seraph is in position, just under a mile from the coast. The town of Hueva is in the distance. Why Hueva? Well, according to the British Assistant Naval Attaché in Madrid, Huelva is home to a large patriotic German community. It is crawling with German spies and has a pro-German police chief. Carefully, Seraph's commander, Lieutenant Bill Jewell, and his crew lift Martin from his tube. Despite the plans, DK has set in and the smell is pretty awful. They inflate his life jacket, attach a briefcase containing the important documents to his waist via a chain and slip him into the sea. A fisherman named Jose finds the body and brings it ashore later that morning. The following day, the corpse of Major Martin, well, Glinder Michaels, is sitting in Welva's morgue. And that is where we will leave it. Until next time, Chumley and Mortecue have done all they can. Now the fate of the mission rests in the hand of the Spanish. So much could go wrong. What if the Spanish don't even open the letters? And even if they do, we know that they don't pass everything they find to the Germans. One thing's for sure. Glinder Michael was unable to serve his country and life. Now in death, he is the most extraordinary secret agent. Operation Mincemeat rests on a neutral country playing its part in the war. Something of a paradox, eh? To hear more about another neutral country, click here for our special on Spy Haven, Switzerland. To get ever more content like this, join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Nine out of ten doctors recommend it. So, I see you next time, darlings.